Hi there, this is Eshu. I'm the abbot here at Zen West Buddhist Society. This Living Zen podcast is just one of the many resources we've created at Zen West to make Zen practice and training more available and accessible to people all over the world. Instructional videos, printable resources, and much, much more are also available on our website at www.zenwest.ca. If you're a regular listener, I'd love to hear from you. So please drop me an email at office at zenwest.ca and let me know who you are, how you got started, and what brought you to Zen. Everything we make available in person and online at Zen West is only possible because of the support of our members and associates, people like you. If the efforts of our community are making a difference in your life, I'd like to invite you to show your support and take part in making it happen by becoming an associate or member of the Zen West Sangha. You can do this by clicking the Join Us tab on our website at www.zenwest.ca. Thank you for your support, and thanks for listening. Well, nobody jumped at the opportunity to talk about how they came to practice, which is okay. So I'll uh, talk a little bit today. Uh, the other day I was reading um, an article that was originally uh, forwarded to me by a member that said that uh, on average uh, people would rather uh, give themselves a shock, an electrical shock, than uh, be alone with their thoughts. This was an experiment that was recently done in which people were given this alternative. And particularly males, they found, rather than sitting and just having nothing to do but uh, let their mind wander, they would rather actually self-administer an electric shock. (laughs) (coughs) This is... um, This is uh, how we feel or how we uh, relate to our own inner world. Now, what's interesting I found about the article is it was very specific. It wasn't just sort of like any old uh, being with your thoughts, but it was actually kind of a practice of just letting the mind wander randomly. So at first, my thought was, well, geez, no wonder it's so difficult for me to uh, grow the membership of the uh, of Zen West. You know, if uh, essentially you're trying to offer people an opportunity for practice and they'd actually rather electrocute themselves <laughs> than engage, uh, uh, that's a tough, that's a tough sell. But no, it's this... Um, being sort of left at sea with our own thinking mind. And this isn't precisely what we do, at least not at first in our Zen practice. One of the things that I've often said is that I don't really understand the term boredom, being bored, I'm bored. I've never really understood this term when people say, let's do something, I'm bored. My experience, my own experience with anything I could call boredom actually lines up with this kind of aversion to allowing my mind to run rampant or free. And it's certainly not boredom. If anything, it's kind of a fear, a worry. So I think for myself, and I think many other people, when we find ourselves in a circumstance where the environment is stable, where it's quiet, where there's not much going on, the mind naturally opens up and expands and begins to just roll, get rolling. And for many of us, that experience can be scary. 
as soon as we start to feel that uh, opening or that process, that rolling start to happen, we have to find a distraction. We have to find something to do in order for us to uh, feel in control or feel stable. Now, ideally, in Zazen, in the depths of Zazen, this is precisely the place where we actually get to, where the mind is actually completely thrown wide open. But we don't start there. That's a very uh, dodgy place. We start with this uh, practice of paying attention to our breath, paying attention to the activity of breathing, paying attention to the arising and dissolving of this breath. When I give instruction on zazen, I always talk about the breath as like a raft in the in a, in a lake, in a big lake, or in an ocean. And in our practice, the beginning of our practice, the first thing that we want to do is get off of the dry land. The dry land is just a way that we view things as being solid or fixed. Ourselves and others, our thoughts and our feelings and our beliefs are all solid like land. But the starting point, literally the jumping off point of Buddhism, is that this concept of things as solid, as objects, as things, with uh, fixed containers is a delusion. It's a false idea. So from the very beginning in our practice, we step off of the land. We step off of the solid and get into the water. But we don't know how to behave in water. We don't know how to swim. So we use these techniques, counting the breath and following the breath like a raft. We fully immerse ourselves in the water of our mind, of our emotions, of our physical sensations in our meditation practice. Itches and aches and thoughts and feelings. And it's like being in the water. And if we just pay attention to our thoughts and our feelings and our physical sensations is just like being in the water without any kind of support. And we can just go from one wave to the next. Pain, and grief, and fear, and anger, and oh, what am I going to do next week? And I need to make a list. And it goes around and around. And our anxiety goes up, 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 until we're you know, doing the, the ladder climbing sign of drowning, right? This is the, the feeling of, uh, at first, boredom that we try to avoid. But it's also the sort of anxiety, panic that we can experience if we're not... Uh, we don't have a method, if we don't have a tool. This is the experience that I think most people would be willing to uh, self-administer electric shock to avoid. But in meditation practice, we really try not to just chuck people in like that. So this method, uh, our breath, This is our raft, this is our uh, support while we uh, develop uh, familiarity and comfort with the sensation of buoyancy, with the sensation of fluidity. So as we sit, particularly in the beginning, the first practice is counting both the in and out breaths. One, two... Three, four. 
so on. And as we do this practice, inevitably, we forget the practice. We're left alone in our mind and in our hearts and in our bodies. Physical sensations arise, mental distractions arise, our emotions arise, and for a moment we let go of the raft and we're adrift. Oh gosh, my legs hurt, oh, my back hurts, oh, that wasn't very nice what they did to me. And as we start to feel the anxiety arise, as we start to feel a bit thrown around by our minds and our bodies, we remember that there's a raft and the practice is just to come back to it, come back to the counting. So we, one, all right, one, two, three, four. And we find that we're able to stabilize again in the ocean of our mind. And as we continue forward in our practice, the space that we create, as we go forward in practice, letting go of one side of counting, the exhalation or the inhalation, This is like intentionally letting go of the raft. Seeing what's what's there. What is the content of our mind? What is the content of our heart? What is going on in our physical sensations? What are the sounds that we're hearing? What are the smells that we're smelling? What are the sights that our eyes can see as we sit? And as we become distracted by them, as the balance begins to tilt and we begin to be sort of drawn in, losing our center, losing our breath, our head going below the water, we can just reach out, always reach out to the breath and find our anchor again, find our support find our raft. And just like learning to swim, learning how to be in the water, the more we practice this, the more we become familiar with the sensation of buoyancy, the more we become, the more we develop the ability to keep our head above water, to continue to breathe in spite of the swells that arise, the less we need to grasp onto the raft. When we realize that we always have this breath, whether we're sitting in the zendo, whether we're walking down the street, whether we're dealing with difficult relationships, whether we're in our work environment, that we always have this raft, that we always have this breath. Once we begin to develop this, we begin to see how many ways that we distract ourselves, how many ways that we actually avoid the content of our mind, the content of our hearts, the physical sensations that we're experiencing, the choices that we make, the activities that we engage in, the habits that we get wrapped up in, not because we want to necessarily, not because we even like them, although Many times we convince ourselves that we do like them. But we begin to see underneath that in truth what we like is that it helps us to avoid just being with ourselves. And as our practice develops, the grip of these things begins to diminish because our familiarity with 
abiding, being with the swells of the mind, of the heart, of the body, becomes a familiar place, becomes uh, our home. There's a shift that can take place in practice where we begin to uh, very quickly let go of distraction. We begin to see how much of our life, how much of our energy, how much of our time we spend just coming up with new and interesting ways to avoid just doing what we're doing, just being as we are with what's arising. We begin to clarify that this simple activity of being just as we are is the foundation of practice. And we begin to actually look for ways that we can just do this. Taking a moment in the evening to just sit on the couch. Listen to the sounds of the street or of the birds. Not having to figure out something to keep ourselves busy but actually finding our way into this moment as our true home without fear, without avoidance, finding our breath and just being able to sit. When we're manifesting in this way, when we're practicing in this way, Who we think we are opens up like a flower, like a blossom. We begin to develop insight into the activities in our life, the activities of the world around us, the activities of the cosmos. This is just a, a practice of being with. And we see as we sit that our emotions arise and they exist and then they dissolve, break apart. Physical sensations arise and they exist and they dissolve and they disappear. Our thoughts are the same, arising, existing, dissolving, disappearing. The anxiety that we feel when a thought or a feeling or a physical sensation begins to arise, begins to dissolve because we witnessed this pattern, waves on the ocean, over and over and over and over again. Just like uh, sitting on a beach and watching the waves, there's all different kinds, all different sizes, all different speeds coming from all different directions. But they all have the same pattern. Even the giant tsunamis and the tiny little ripples all arise and exist and dissolve and disappear. So as we sit, there is nothing to fear because they're not separate from us. We are able to just sit, abide, witness, experience, and let them go. This is just a simple activity of being. This is the manifestation of the plus activity arising, the minus activity dissolving. This is the activity of birth and the activity of death. It isn't something that's 
uh, mysterious. It's not something that you have to go on a, a vision quest to grasp, go to Asia, some magical monastery in the clouds. This is the very content of your life. In the Soto school, they uh, have this term shikantaza, which is often translated as just sitting. In the Chinese tradition, Cao Tung, which is the Soto tradition in Japanese, it's translated as silent illumination. But it's all, don't get caught up in these uh, fancy terms. Because I think the way of understanding it, a way of understanding it, is just this simple activity of wholeheartedly being. Developing this practice of being, developing this ability, which we all innately have, there's nothing else to do but be. Uh, Rinzai uses this term buji, which is uh, doing nothing or having nothing to do, non-doing. It's pointing to the same thing. Just as we are whole and complete, emotions arising, thoughts arising, physical sensations arising, there's nothing to do. There's nowhere to go. Witnessing them, abiding, letting them go just waves on the ocean. After some time in practice, we find, at least I've found, that the idea of people wanting to avoid this experience wanting to do anything but investigate this activity is a very sad thought. The concept or the teaching about hungry ghosts in Buddhism, ulambana, which is upside down, right? Hanging upside down. The idea is that we, as hungry ghosts, we look at what is uh, unhelpful as helpful and what is uh, helpful as unhelpful. We're afraid of the very things that are of benefit and we chase after the things that will do us harm. And when I read an article like this that, that suggests that many of us would just as soon shock ourselves as spend a minute with our own minds. Uh, this is the, uh, the image that sort of arises in my mind. Hungry ghosts. So uh, as we continue our practice together, I'm always just very grateful for people who are willing to uh, take up, get into the water, take up this practice of learning to, to float, learning to be, learning to be water. Thanks for listening to the Living Zen Podcast. If you follow Living Zen through iTunes, I would very much appreciate it if you would take a moment to let me know what you think about it by rating or reviewing the podcast so that new listeners can also hear what you have to say. Thank you for your time and for your support.